come to you a PhD at the University of Arizona with Alan Sente, um, and then a postdoc with Dorwager at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and since 2015, um, I've been directing the Computational, Social, and Effective Neuroscience Lab here at Dartmouth, uh, studying a variety of different topics, mostly in the realm of uh, social interactions and computational modeling of those kind of interactions. And I think of the lab is that we've really been at the forefront of bringing computational tools uh, into social neuroscience. So it's really um, exciting work that's been pushing the kind of questions that it's been possible to ask. Um, so it's a huge privilege to have him as a colleague here in the department uh, and as a co-organizer for the summer school. So if you, if you know Luke, um, then think from what your team has been here, he's obviously brilliant, but what you may not know about Luke is that uh, he also found it So mapping social spaces. So this is this topic for me is really fun because, uh, well, I don't really do any of this, so that's one. <laughs> and the second is because it's really awesome to be able to connect the social stuff with, um, I think, the really neat stuff that's going on in cognitive and, and navigation and, and maps and reinforcement learning. Okay, so what are spatial, social spaces exactly anyway? Um, so we're kind of embedded in them all the time. Usually it's me walking to conversation, everyone kind of looks at each other and is like, what's going on? Um, what does this person just say? <laughs> Why are they still here? Um, what's fun is that this also happens even if you don't know each other. So we had some conversations, um, I think it was, might have been with the faculty at dinner one night where you could be on the subway in New York and everyone just, no one knows each other, all strangers, but everyone's just looking at each other because something weird's happening, everyone's checking in. And it's not everyone doing this, it's only a few people and you have this like quick um, glance and you share a moment and have a connection, which is really fun. Um, so for me, it often looks something like this. <laughs> Uh, so I once gave advice to someone maybe this week about you should have like set up your talk and have some goals. So I thought I should do that even though we're not going to hit any of them. Um, so things we might talk about are do people view the world the same way? And can we lever some type of structured social variation and understanding how the brain works and, and the mind in general? Um, how do people infer social relationships? Um, but really, just to be clear, this is why mind is one of my favorite things. It's the only time when I have like an excuse to just like talk about a bunch of methods and how you can apply it in this stuff. Um, whereas if I do this, it's in social venues, it's like social psychology, um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't go over very well. Uh, so social maps, a, a bit of a historical perspective. So it's fun because we got to hear a lot about Tolman and Dave Reddish had lots of nice references to people in navigation and, um, and everyone has had lots and lots and lots of nice things. But what about early days in social? What was that like? So um, Tali mentioned Kurt Lewin. He, he was like kind of at the forefront of social psychology, but also um, one of his books, Principles of Topological Psychology, was basically trying to um, define psychology and, and environments in terms of um, basically trying to take math principles like topology and vector calculus. So you can imagine he basically tried to describe that there's these spaces and they're going to shape how we're going to um, and move around. The person's going to be in there. The person is, these things are going to change over time. The person's going to have goals, which are also going to influence how they navigate. So he comes up with this very descriptive uh, behavior equals a function of person in their environment, um, which you know I think was ambitious and, and nice. And I think we're moving forward that now, but it didn't get a lot of traction, I think, unfortunately. Um, I recently discovered um, a couple other really uh, interesting things. So um, uh, uh, Stuart uh, Dodd was a sociologist who wrote this really impressive book, um, which I have not finished reading yet, uh, on, called Dimensions of, Soci uh, of Society, where he tried to basically bridge statistics and math to basically have a comprehensive understanding of like sociology. Um, and then there was another um, uh, Stuart who was a physicist and was basically talking about, kind of, Tali also mentioned this about people and trying to model groups and rumors and, and things like that um, using um, gravitational field theory and, and stuff like that. Um, also, none of this got a lot of traction, but I think it was really interesting historically. For me, uh, even more interesting historically is what happened to these people. So 
you could write a book that's 944 pages where you derive all of these functions of how people work. You can have these beautiful maps of like how forces interacting. This is like social networks, maybe even like an eigenvector centrality. Uh, um, basically spreading density of like how Christianity spread based on the density of populations. There's all these just really beautiful maps and ways people were trying to define these things back in the 30s through 50s. And what's cited more than this book is the review of it, which was published in the most prestigious um, journal of, of sociology, uh, which was a critique of Dodd's dimensions of society. So a volume of 944 pages attempts to integrate sociological theory, statistical theory, blah, 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 blah. Um, but the punchline, if you don't want to read the entire article, is, which is not highlighting there. Upon investigation, his scheme appears to be arbitrary and sterile. There would seem to be no justification for the belief that the S theory makes any major contributions to sociology. And basically, my experience um, trying to think about how we can study social stuff from a computational perspective, be it like when I was applying for graduate school, or when I was in graduate school, or applying for conferences, or jobs, or beyond, this has been a pretty routine thing. So welcome and have fun. <laughs> Hopefully, if you want to throw your career away, this is where you should go. Just kidding. Um, so you guys got to see some, some people from our department of different speakers. And we're kind of in, this is a very arbitrary network, by the way. It's much more densely connected than it might appear. Um, uh, and I think the thing that connects the social and the cognitive and the navigation is that we can represent all of these um, type of information as graphs. And that's kind of the link of maps, I think. Um, so we can have an adjacency matrix of our thing, which can produce the graph that I showed you. Um, but also, there's different types of ways we can describe these things. So they can be clustered. Um, so one easy way is that some of us are in the social area, whatever that means, because um, we don't really do social psychology as, tr as traditionally um, been studied. Um, there's a cognitive area, which is very diffuse, and it's not clear what the boundaries are of social and cognitive. We also have a behavioral neuroscience area, um, which really is mostly because you study um, small rodents and compared to humans. That's the main distinction. But the topics overlap quite a bit. Um, but the question is, we've had like different perspectives on maps from all of these different areas, and do we see the world the same way? Or, or are we basically kind of colored um, by our, our lenses, and that the people in our groups, we kind of see problems the same way, but in other groups, we see them differently. Um, so why is that? That doesn't sound crazy, I don't know, to me. Um, but what's crazy is that that's completely ignored in how we do all of research. So this might look familiar to you from intro statistics. Uh, the fundamental assumption of how we make us, um, inferences is that we assume that there's some um, um, true effect in the middle and that there's lots of sampling and measurement noise around it. And we're basically just trying to get at what's the mean of this distribution. Um, but if there's any structure in, in what we're doing, so if we can look over people and we assume everyone's just a random sample from a bigger distribution and that whatever we converge on is the true effect and that's the mean. But if we have all these groups and perspectives and all these things, there's no way that that could be true. And we're basically ignoring that. That's, so that's all ending up in the residual. So I'm going to continue with this idea of like what it means to find things that are the same across people. So one way this has been studied, I think, in a, in a really innovative and exciting way um, that was pioneered by Uri Hassan and his colleagues um, is called intersubject correlation. And Talia talked a little bit about this um, with, with her work um, just a little bit ago. So basically, there's lots of ways to do this. but um, in this particular one, each line here is a subject, and they're watching a movie. And it's, this is like basically average activation for each sub, um, subject while they're watching it over time. And you can see that there's a really tight coupling here. And it makes sense because most, for the most part, like light and all these things are happening the same way. As information comes in, um, it's being translated in some way, and then it kind of propagates up the, the, the cortical processing hierarchy. So you can basically take, um, in time, you could take what each of these um, traces over time are of activation and look at the similarity um, so between each person, so a pairwise similarity, and then we can calculate the mean of that, and that would kind of give us an overall estimate of how much people are synchronizing. There's lots of other ways to calculate this too, by the way. So this, this metric has a bunch of really cool properties. Um, so um, Uri and his colleagues um, had this really neat paper um, where they tried to link intersubject connectivity to other things like spike firing and local fuel potentials. So they had two patients um, where they were doing single unit recordings, and they basically looked at firing rates and convolved it with a, with a human dynamic response function kernel, and they found that that correlated very strongly with the group intersubject correlation and, and primary auditory cortex while they were watching like a short movie. Um, they also looked at different power bands and local fuel potentials and found that it positively correlated with broadband gamma and negatively with these kind of lower um, um, frequencies. So one, that's kind of nice because it's, it's at least connecting like bold responses that it's capturing something that has to do with 
maybe what the underlying um, neurophysiology is. But there's a, an implicit assumption, like as I just said, where we're assuming everybody's the same and are all brain processes really shared across people? I think it makes sense for sensor, early sensory, but does that actually um, true for how we interpret the world as we go more towards the front of the brain? Um, so this idea, it's been kind of, I think lots of people have been thinking about it and working towards it. So this was a study I really liked by Daniel Margulius, um, where he basically looked at functional connectivity in the macaque and also in humans and at rest, and then basically um, did a, a, a dimensionality reduction on it to try to figure out is there any inherent structure and he basically finds at least two components that he calls gradients, and then you can project them back into the brain. And one gradient is basically, um, you can kind of see the sensory motor and visual. Um, and then there's this other one that's basically goes from like uh, more sensory cortices to more association cortex. And that ends up being like a lot of this default mode that Megan talked a bit about and, and others, and this kind of broad social mentalizing um, networks, which um, many of us have talked about, and I'll, I'll continue to go today. And you can basically decode these things using Neurosynth, which is basically just like a, a prior on what the published literature is. And you can see that as you go up this gradient, it goes from sensory motor um, up to more higher level, like emotion, social cognition, verbal semantics, um, autobiographical memory types of processing. Um, so to study that, this was um, a collaboration with our lab and Jeremy, um, and, and led primarily by Jin and, and Eshin. We wanted to try to studying like how emotional experiences or things like that, which it seem, uh, it's, one would suspect that those wouldn't be shared across people, um, to try to explore this idea. And we had participants watch uh, a character-driven drama um, about Texas high school football, um, and uh, we basically scanned them while they did that. And, I'm just going to show you a couple scenes to give you an idea. Um, so this is like this. In the first episode, they throw this game-winning touchdown, and there's a lot of excitement, exuberance. Uh, but then there's people who are a bit more flat in their affect. Um, but it's not that she's completely flat. She, she basically is interpreting the things differently. So when that same um, quarterback makes a mistake where he hits the front of one of his teammates' helmets, um, she, she's, she's more <laughs> amused by that. I think some of us know who our friends would be in this, uh, these two groups already. <laughs> Um, so we can basically use this intersubject um, correlation metric to try to find how, where are the signals in the brain that are consistent across people. And we replicate all of Uri's findings where it seems to be we get stronger intersubject correlations in primary auditory and primary visual, and then also up kind of like the, the ventral and, and dorsal pathways. But when you start getting towards the front of the brain, um, that's when you start seeing like almost no degree of synchrony. And this is in two different studies on two different scanners, but the same um, show. Okay, so one idea is like, okay, well, you're, you're basically looking at a correlation over 45 minutes, so maybe there's something that's just a burst that happens in time. So we can also, rather than looking at synchrony in time, we can also look at synchrony in space. So for every TR or every sample of brain data we have, we can take divided brain in different regions and look at the spatial similarity across subjects using the same type of metric. And it's, it's weaker than time, but for, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, and basically I'm just averaging, so this is like um, from V1 and from the VMPFC, and it's basically just what the overall average um, inner subject spatial um, connectivity is, or correlation. And this is just averaging that over time. And you can see it's weaker overall, and some regions are going up and down. But the VMPFC, it goes up a little bit, but it's pretty low overall. So one idea, um, there's, 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 there's a lot of possibilities why this might be happening. So uh, first, maybe you can't actually record signal using bold fMRI in the VMPFC. That's actually pretty likely because there's a, a big um, sinus above your orbital sinus that, and where air meets tissue, you get these um, lots of signal dropout and distortion. Another possibility is that, um, as Jim Haxby talked about, maybe our voxels aren't aligned and we're doing a really bad job with anatomic alignment there. And so if we used a functional alignment technique like hyperalignment, we would do better. So we try to realign these voxels. So these, in this group of subjects, they all watched two episodes. So in the second episode, we used um, um, a version of hyperalignment and then um, projected the aligned data back in the first episode and then did the same thing. Oops. And you can see that some areas, so these are all the regions that increase um, after the hyperalignment proce um, procedure. So again, this just replicates all of the stuff that Jim said, that a lot of the brain increases in, in synchronization. 
um, and you can see this is including phasic bursts where it's going from like on average 0.2 to maybe on average 0.4 or 5. Um, but the VMPFC like doesn't seem to benefit that much from it again. And one reason for this is that this particular version of hyperonic, there's other ones that don't have the same assumption, but it's basically assuming the reason how it knows how to realign the voxels is because they have a similar time course or similar response function to the stimuli. But if we're watching the show and I personally actually can't stand football and I don't even know what the rules are, I might care about different um, scenes than someone who grew up playing it and is really into it, right? Um, but that might not make sense for a visual cortex, but as we're starting to think about how we're evaluating the stimuli and what meaning they have to us, that that would start to um, impact the processing more. And I think that's what this area of the brain is doing. Um, so what we tried to do is look, okay, well, over the group, we don't see anything, but what if we look at a single subject? How do we rule out that this isn't noise, um, that there might be some signal there? So, um, so what we did is, this is just one randomly random subject, and we took the, um, um, a mask of, of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and looked at the spatial pattern and how, when we saw that spatial pattern again over time, how similar was it to other time points during this 45 minute um, movie watching? So this is time by time similarity. And you can see that there's these, um, this kind of block diagonal structure where there's times where the VMPFC kind of persists in the same pattern um, for a while. And some of these blocks are about up to about three minutes long. So, you know, we think of brain activation happening really fast and that's true, but there's also information that's being pro um, processed at a slower time scale. Also, it looks like there's only um, a few different states, at least by this metric and visualization, that the VMPFC might be bouncing around between. So this state, for example, happens to be different from this state, but this state and this state are similar because you can see a positive correlation between those patterns. So it might be that there's like a load of um, just a couple states where the VMPFC is bouncing around from. Okay, so this is one subject. Do all subjects show this? And how similar are these types of patterns across subjects? So here's just a few more. Um, pretty much all subjects show this block diagonal structure, but almost none of them show the exact same, um, this temporal recurrence. Um, there's parts of it where they might be the same. So this is that first scene where everyone, most people were smiling. Um, this is that winning football touch scene. And for these three subjects, at least, they, they are kind of having a, a, a consistent block um, of their VMPFC activation. So we can try to um, look at the consistency of this by stacking all the subject specific matrices. There's a couple ways to do it. This is one of them. And then just seeing like, is there any cell of this matrix that's consistent over people? Um, and what we find when we do um, statistics controlling for the network comparisons that there's like hardly anything that survives other than a slight bit of autocorrelation off the main diagonal. But it's not the technique in general because if we use other regions like the like early visual, um, we see that a lot of things survive and also that they have a much faster changing over time as we might expect. So what are the spatial and temporal consistency of these VMPF states across subjects? Um, so to, to do this, we um, borrowed um, a technique that was, um, I think, at least for, for me, exposed to from uh, Chris Baldassano when he was here for a mind um, one year, our first year. And we fit um, a hidden Markov model to basically the voxel by time um, brain activity for every subject separately. And it basically learns like what the transition probability structure is, and then we um, apply the model back um, and then it, it's basically trying to find what these latent states are that basically can be um, manifested by the, the, the voxel activations. And then you can apply the model back and get a predicted state, so it's just the max of what state it thinks it is at any given time. Um, and so if we go back to that same subject before, it does a really good job of identifying where these state changes happen that we're seeing by eye. Um, and this allows us to say, okay, well, let's, let's see how consistent are these things over subjects. Um, so the first way we did it is like, what are the, how does the model, so it finds these three states. I, uh, I can explain afterwards how we did it. It's, it's, it's pretty hand wavy um, on how we pick the number of states. Um, what's the spatial pattern for every subject that goes with state and can we use those to align the states across people? So this is just a, a every, we have three maps per subject and then we just do um, a spatial similarity and cluster it and you can see that um, all the subjects seem to have a very similar spatial pattern for one of these clusters. Many of them have a, a similar one for the second one, and the third one it might just be kind of a junk um, cluster where are lots of different things, but everyone's fairly idiosyncratic. Um, so what this means is that across subjects, it's not that it's complete noise. There's some type of spatial similarity that's happening across in, in these different patterns or states that are, um, that are occurring. Um, so this is just an example of one where it's like low weights here. This is the average of it, and high weights more towards the, um, the genu of the of the, of the singulate. Um, 
But the next question is, is oh, and then we can look at the time course over it. <clears throat> so this is just the, this first one here for V1 and for VMPFC. And this is the, per, per, the, the number of subjects or the proportion of subjects who are in that state at that moment in time. And for V1, there's states where almost 90 to 100 percent of subjects are in that same state. Um, but a lot of times they're not. Um, so these are actually usually like scene changes where there's a huge um, change in the color uh, and visual properties. Uh, but for VMPFC, there's not really um, many things, maybe right here, where uh, the proportion of subjects gets above 50%. So most of the sample is, is experiencing different things at the same moments in time. So let's like zoom in a little bit more on, on V1 here. So these are, we're just going to look at the first two states. We're going to ignore the third one. And this is the same metric. Um, so it's the, um, the proportion of subjects are in that state at the same time after we've realigned the states based on their spatial patterns. And for these 13 subjects, while they're watching it, you kind of see that these states seem to kind of oscillate it, and they, they're almost anti-correlated. And when this state's active, this is this winning touchdown scene. When this state's active, it's when the star quarterback that they built this whole narrative around um, gets injured and has a spinal injury where he is paralyzed. Um, so there, there's a hint that this might be like affect or something about how you're making meaning or that um, arousal might be organizing the synchronization of people, as, as Talia has shown um, with Olivia Kong. Or, as we think in our lab, it's probably just overfitting and of noise. So to get around that, we ran it again um, in, an, in a different scanner, different subjects, and, and basically replicate the same effect. Um, so it seems to be fairly reliable. But we still don't know like what these states are processing other than this kind of like hand wavy reverse correlation that, that I'm saying. Like I know this scene's about this, so maybe that's what people are doing. Um, so to try to get a little bit more insight into it, um, we had another group of subjects watch um, the show outside the scanner and we record their facial expressions. So this was, um, we're using some hardware and software that was um, built by Jin um, Chong and an undergrad who was our lab, um, Sawyer Brooks. And basically it's a GoPro affixed to your head <laughs> and then we've found a, a way to synchronize them just by minimizing the difference of the audio envelope. Um, and this is, this technique's really cool because you can actually have groups of people interacting and it's fairly, um, well, it looks weird, so you wouldn't be in public, but it's, it doesn't, you can actually, it doesn't affect the interaction too much. Um, and then if you want, you can download the blueprints and print your own. Um, so next, we, we basically had people watch this, and then we did a, um, a PCA over the facial expression. So we used this computer vision technique to take um, the pixels and convert them into groups of muscles firing, which we call action units. And then we try to learn some multivariate um, um, representation of of um, the facial expressions. And we basically, I'm plotting the two that basically correlate with both um, the positive and negative states, or these two blue and red states, um, across both studies. And then I can, we're visualizing, so this is basically how much the face deforms by the facial expression, and then the colors represent the intensity of the action units, or where we think the muscles are probably located. Um, and this visualization, the software to do this was developed by an undergrad lab, um, Sophie Byrne. Um, and state one is basically, you get the zygomaticus, so the smiling. Um, and for state two, you get this eyes widening um, and mouth opening. And that, if you, you can't really see this, but if you looked at these more carefully, that's exactly what the facial expressions are showing um, by the subjects. So that's like a behavior, um, and we can interpret what those facial expressions mean. Um, but we can also ask people how they're feeling. So we had another group of subjects. This is about 200 people on, on Amazon Mechanical Turk watch the same movie. And then we pause the movie random times and then ask them how they're feeling on about 16 different dimensions. Um, and this was also uh, led by a different undergraduate, Nathan Greenstein, who built this web app and, and interface to Mechanical Turk. So we could do this, basically we can do about 500 people simultaneously without crashing our server. Um, and then once we have this data, um, we get this giant sparse matrix. So we have um, every row is a subject and every column is a time point of a rating for one single dimension. And we use um, um, a matrix completion technique from a family of tools called collaborative filtering um, to basically infer um, what the missing data might have been for joy, for example. And basically the only assumption, there's lots of different ways to do this, but in the way when we're doing it is saying there's some number of people that have a similar preference, and then we're basically using them to help you infer what the missing data is. So what's nice is it allows, it maintains individual variation. So you can still see that people are different. It's not just doing the group mean. And you can see sadness is different than joy. Um, and we can do the same um, PCA um, thing that we did for um, re dimension reduction that we did for the facial expressions for the um, emotions. And these are basically the factor loadings that correlate with the VMPFC um, across both studies. So the first state um, we see uh, correlate loads highly on joy, pride, hope, satisfaction, elation, relief. Um, so things that are more positive. 
Um, and the second one is more negative, but mixed. Um, so guilt, sadness, but also maybe pride, I think, um, a little bit of envy. Um, so it's a little bit more mixed, but, um, but it seems to be trending towards negative. And if we take the time series of all these different things, it, you can kind of see these two different factors that emerge, which seems to be valence. So um, basically, at the, at the simplest possible level, and I think as we start looking at with more um, fidelity, we're going to see more than two dimensions. But when you're making appraisals or making meaning of what's going on in the show, this region seems to be, at the very least, saying this seems like good or bad. <laughs> A lot of methods to get something that was pretty self-evident in the beginning. <laughs> um, so that's it. <laughs> okay, well, let's keep going. <laughs> so what if variation isn't Gaussian noise, um, but has some type of structure, so maybe like a graph? Um, so the idea of this is that we can use um, social, how similar people are, how far away they are from each other, as a way to link between different types of behavior. So we can use it as a link function. Um, so we're calling this um, <laughs> not very originally and not very um, descriptively, intersubject representational similarity analysis. Um, and so the idea is you can have in any type of behavioral space, it could be um, unidimensional or multidimensional, um, but it seems to work better that we found with, um, with multidimensional representations. So you can calculate pairwise distance on that. So it could be like a questionnaire, for example. So this is um, kind of a, a validation study that it was led by Andy Chen. Um, so if you think rather than taking a summary score of like, like a depression inventory, um, you can basically treat all of those questions as like a as an axis in some multidimensional space, and and basically where people answer as a point in that space, and then we can look at distance in that in that multidimensional space, and we can do the same thing for um, brain patterns, and this can be in space or time, um, and we see how similar subjects are, and if there's if it's noise, there should be no relation between this if it's truly Gaussian. But if there's something where people see things the same way or answer the question the same way, then something related to the construct reflected in here should be reflect um, some type of structure in the brain processes that might underlie that. Um, so again, it's like the basically the sort of distance between people is how we're linking between these two different disparate types of data. Um, so we've basically validated this across a number of different data sets. Um, in this particular one, we find that uh, you can have a construct that measures something, and as long as it's being probed, you'll see activation consistent with what we think that construct's measuring. So this particular one was like reward and social cognition. But if you apply that same um, um, uh, metric to like a neutral video, because that neutral video isn't probing like rewarding or social types of processes, it doesn't actually correlate with anything. And if you use a different measure, like let's say self-control or something like that, it, has, it correlates with different um, uh, brain structures consistent with what that um, construct would reflect, the processes that construct would reflect. So we're, we're reasonably confident that, um, that this technique is working the way it should. Um, we're still working, so um, Jin and, and Eshin are working on a way to come up with the proper way to do um, inferences over this, because there's different types of data structures that um, make like standard p-value estimation a little bit trickier. Um, how am I on time, guys? 10 minutes, okay. Uh, hmm. Yarun's here, and it'd be fun to talk about his stuff. <laughs> but Yarun's here, and it'd be fun to cut his stuff. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go really quick. So I'm not gonna set this, 15, yeah, okay. Um, so I'm not gonna set this up um, t entirely, but I just wanna give you another example of how you can use this technique to study something else, instead of like natural movie watching, which is what we're mostly gonna talk about today. Um, so this one, um, Yarun, um, when he was a graduate student with Alan Sanfi, um, did some, uh, a study that was following up some of my work uh, in graduate school, uh, with a trust game. And basically the trust game is there's a player who invests some amount of money um, in player B and they think that the multiplier is four. Um, and then in this version of trust game, we call it a hidden multiplier. The, the second player can gets that m pot of money and then sometimes it's multiplied by four and then they choose how much to return. But sometimes um, they know that the multiplier is six, but player A doesn't, they still think it's four. And then they can choose how much of that multiplied money to do. Um, <clears throat> So I'm not gonna really go into the things, but basically we had some predictions that there are different ways you could play this game, There's depending on what your motivations are. So you, for example, you might care a lot about fairness and making sure everyone has a fair outcome. So if there's $60 at stake, you would just divide that in half and so you'd spend 30 back to the other person and keep 30 for yourself, even though the other person doesn't, knows, doesn't know that the multiplier is six. But if you're guilt averse, for example, where you're trying to not disappoint the other person, you're gonna use your beliefs about what they believe is true in the game. And in that case, you would send 20 back because you think that's what they expect, but you, they don't know that the multiplier is higher, so you would keep all that money. So this is what we would call guilt aversion. 
But in this time two multiplier, it's really interesting because in equity version, you, you split it halfway. But if you want to be guilt averse, where you kind of seemed like a little bit of a scumbag here, you actually would give up all of your money in return. And so you would get nothing, but then you still wouldn't disappoint the other person. And this almost seems kind of crazy why anyone would do this in a game. Um, so this design um, that Yuren came up with um, nicely kind of dissociates between these different strategies. Um, and basically, we came up with a model on how we can represent these different types of strategies um, in a two-dimensional space. And then we can simulate behavior in this task um, just by varying the, the parameter space. So on one side, this is how greedy you are. Um, and it predicts, the so it's basically what the investment is. And it's, it's basically showing how much the model thinks you, you're going to return. And the different colors are depending on the context, whether it's a two, four, or six multiplier. So if you're greedy, it just says you're going to keep all the money, except maybe when there's a ton, then maybe you'll share a little bit. And as you go this way, where you might have a social preference or care about the other person's outcome, um, there's two different types of um, predictions depending on this fee parameter. So if you're an equity reverse, it just says you're going to divide it in half. And as you go down here, you're going to basically just return the amount the other person expects. And that's always going to be the same, even though you're going to get different payoff amounts. And an interesting thing is there's some combination of the parameters that um, produce like a hybrid strategy, which um, is a context dependent um, behavior, where if you're in the one context, you might use an equity version. And when you're in the other context, you might use guilt aversion. And the way the game is set up, there's actually a strategic reason why you might do that, where you, you will look like you care about the other person's outcome, but you're still going to make more money for yourself just by not being consistent in the strategy you use. So it's kind of cool this comes out from the model. OK, so how does this relate to maps? Well, we can basically plot every subject in this two-dimensional space and calculate the pairwise distance from them. And then use this inner subject um, representational similarity analysis to try to see, are there any regions in the brain that show the same structure to figure out which regions might have varying patterns or varying processes that are involved in these different types of strategies? And that's the answer. So <laughs> this is about as all I'm going to say about this. <laughs> um, so basically, it works. And then the rest of the paper is trying to convince reviewers and ourselves that it was something meaningful. Um, but just because I'm showing a method, we don't really care about that. So the next question um, I'm going to tell you all about is some preliminary work we've been doing on how we build um, mental representations of others. So this work is basically Eshin's um, dissertation. And I'm just going to call him a pre-postdoc, because that's how he's been operating in our lab. And hopefully, very soon, he will be a real postdoc. Um, so in this study, what he did, uh, they did use the same Friday Night Lights um, uh, stimuli. But instead of watching one or two episodes in the scanner, he uh, had f they watched four episodes in the scanner. And then the, after that, he scanned them while they did four different types of memory tasks. And then they rated characters on a whole bunch of different things, and including um, like different types of social networks. So how people, who, like what influence networks, who liked who, or who was influenced by who, or who trusts who. Um, and it's basically uh, an, an undirected, um, or sorry, a directed graph. And basically, he scanned. This is this crazy data set. It's like six hours of data per subject in the scanner. Um, OK, so I just wanted to show you a little clip of like what I'm talking about. And for me, this doesn't work like it did for Talia. Well, the sound doesn't really matter. Basically, it's um, two characters. So this is Tyra, and this is Smash. And they're kind of flirting at this party. And then Tyra's boyfriend walks up and isn't happy about that and starts um, trying to express that to both of them and say, maybe you guys uh, should back off, because this is, this is my girlfriend. And um, you know, obviously, people are property. So no, it, I'm just not kidding about that. Um, but it's basically kind of like, you know, this is like a high school drama, so um, typical relation things. And so you know, me explaining to you, and if you were to watch it and hear the sound, you'd be able, even if you couldn't watch this, you could probably figure out what's going on a little bit about what this um, network is happening. Um, so that Tim doesn't seem to like Smash, but they both seem to have some type of affinity for Tyra. Um, What's crazy is that seems really simple and easy for us. And I bet you even like children could do this fairly well. But if you had a computer do it, it's really, really hard to get a computer to do this. Because it's not that they can't figure out the identities. They can do that really well. But they can't read the intentions or what the mental models of the other people, which is what you are using to be able to make this inference. Um, so we've been working on this problem a lot. So Brian Gonzalez, who's around, I think, this morning, um, has been working on how we basically make mental models of others and use basically based on their actions using things like inverse reinforcement learning. And this particular example I'm going to show is how, um, not how, but really, is there evidence that people are doing this? And what, is it, what processes might be facilitating that in the brain? 
So how do we learn relationships between people? Okay, so again, this is we're gonna the first analysis I'm gonna show you is just using the same intersubject representational similarity analysis. So there's some relationship between all the characters, and p every person viewing it is gonna have some um, um, evaluation or some judgment about what that is. But there's gonna be some noise where we're all slightly different, and some of us might defer in the same way. So maybe Eshin and, and I see this world or see this network more similarly than than Jin does. Um, and then if that's true, um, using this um, di social distance as this link function again, um, we would expect to see corresponding differences in the, pat in, in the regions that uh, might be involved in making those judgments. So people with similar perceptions should have similar brain responses and in regions involved in the computation. So this is basically, this has been pre-processed a little bit, but this is like um, a little bit of like every subject's um, graphs look like, and every node is a different character. So there's some consistency if you look at the average, but there's actually quite a bit of variation. And if we basically align that, yeah. So Do you happen yep. to know how much each person likes each character, or how much characters like each other according to their perception? Um, we have both. So we have how much character each subject likes each character, which I'll talk about later. Um, this particular one is how much each subject thought each character liked the other character. Yeah, and then so it's like a basically a directed um, um, graph, and then we basically look at the similarity of those across subjects, and then you get these two um, pairwise distances, and then we basically just try to find regions that have a similar um, um, structure. And the regions that, that come out and survive um, pretty rigorous um, correction include um, things like the posterior cingulate, the temporal parietal junction, the superior temporal sulcus, the sort of anterior temporal lobe. Um, and this is just like a, a threshold map from, from Neurosynth on if you use the word social, and it's basically all the regions that people consistently found in social stuff. But now we're doing it on variations and how people are thinking re people relate to each other. And we've, done, we've replicated this across a couple of different data sets. So what's interesting is that this is showing the brain processes that might be involved in making these judgments, um, but we don't know how or when or why. That's like the next step that, that Eshin's been working on. And as kind of like a preliminary foray into that, one thing that, that Eshin's done is he's basically divided up the show into um, different types of network motifs. Um, so these are basically scenes or segments. It's actually, he's going basically every TR at that sampling frequency and trying to find who's on the screen and what, what, how they relate to other people. And so the, one of the most common ones across these like basically three hours of, of the show is this mentorship um, relationship between the coach and this one um, player. Um, Another one, it might be a more familiar one, which is the coach's family. So his wife and daughter, both of those around, but it doesn't matter. You can't read them anyway. Um, and another one might be like a team. So these are all the football players. And so they're on the screen playing football at the same time. Um, and so his first um, pass of this analysis is basically saying, okay, well now let's just estimate like what the average um, response is at all these different motifs and then try to see, is there any um, structure across people in these scenes when they're watching them that is consistent across people? So this is like almost like a second order um, RSA analysis. So there's some, everybody has like a, a similarity structure and then he's trying to find the ones where that similarity structure is consistent. So it's like this, where subjects are similar on the similarity structure, if that's clear. Um, and what he finds is um, the same network also, in, in, but adding in um, the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex and then also some amygdala and some ventral striatal and other brainstem regions. Um, and so we're still trying to make sense of like what this actually means, but this allows us to actually say that these are things are, there is some signal in time that we're gonna be able to figure out what's going on and how these things are going. So in the future, I think we're, we're hoping to be able to use um, different types of, of, of learning models and, and how people learn what the state space is. Um, and then the last part of his dissertation is, does this organization or the structure impact um, like how we represent people and would we, this be reflected in when we remember them or when we recall them? And so he has, he has lots of different tasks and lots of different findings, but this very first one, the only one I'm gonna show is just a simple free recall. So after, after the end of the show, they get out, they're, in the, they're being scanned again and they said, just list all the characters you can remember in any order you want. And, and it's, I think there's a total of about 13 characters they could recall. And so what I'm gonna plot is, can we basically, um, is there any structure in the order and how they recall it? And it's basically based on distance and the response. So if two people, if you say, like I remember that there was Tyra and Smash and Tim, I think those are characters I've already said, 
those might be related because they form a network or they might be related because they might be re recalled because they were on the screen a lot. So he's basically using like um, a distance regression technique to try to figure out par partial divariance out to figure out which types of things independently are explaining the, the structure of the recall. So first, does, is there anything about the type of person or trait or grouping? So like football players, do people group the football players together? Um, and that doesn't seem to be the case. So they're basically all the subjects are kind of centered at zero there. Um, what about their impression similarities? So they rated them on all these different dimensions, how attractive they are, how much they like them, does it remind them of a friend, uh, and a whole bunch of things like that. And those also don't seem to uh, impact yeah, uh, the, the, the recall order. Um, but things that do is, do they have a similar amount of time on the screen? So characters are on the screen more, are they recalled um, in, in closer proximity than ones who were on the screen less? And that seems to matter. Um, when characters co-occurred, so we were talking about these graph things, at the very least, if people are co-occurring, that, that should impact it, but it doesn't seem to impact the recall, um, the, or the recall order. Uh, on, clicker. Um, but different types of traits that describe um, how people relate to each other, so like do they gossip with each other, do they do other things like that, that seems to impact it. And then lastly, he, he did two different um, graph metrics of friendship and family networks, so this is communicability, so it's like if you do a random walk on a graph, how like, likely is it that you're going to find anybody else on the graph? And those um, strongly predict the distance order. So basically if you're on the screen a lot, so like some of the main characters, you're going to recall them first, but then you're going to immediately recall um, people who that person relates to and spends a lot of time with and has a relationship with. Um, so basically the idea is that these relationships are um, um, structured, they're basically organizing how we make sense of people. And, th and it's not just about aspects of the person, um, but it's also how they're connected to other people. Okay, he's done, basically spent the last year and a half running analyses, like 100 analyses a day. So there's a whole bunch of different findings he has that, and if you're interested in learning more about this, um, he would love to tell you about it. <laughs> okay, so the take home points. Um, I don't remember what I was going to say. Uh, it looks like this is some <laughs> from some picture in a book where it's a whole bunch of social interactions, phrenology, and yeah, that's about all I'm going to say. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I just want to thank um, all the people in the lab, and especially Eshin and Jin, who have done a lot of the work, and Yurun, who was on, um, led the, uh, that, that um, intersubject trust game work, and then our funding and then uh, lots of uh, research assistants who have helped collect the data. And just like Talia's lab, we're also hiring, we have um, room for a couple postdocs if you're interested in either coming to do this type of work or um, even working remotely, we'll, we'll take anybody right now. Um, <laughs> not desperate, but looking for the right person. <laughs> All right, thanks. Yeah, so to my knowledge, and correct me wrong, we haven't done that exact analysis, but that's on the docket of things to explore of like what the roles are and if there's th there's like some representation that's consistent if you're like a mother or is there like a mother pattern, for example, or a friend pattern or things like that. Yeah, you want to add anything? Any other questions? Daniela. Um, it's really interesting. I was wondering if you remember or represented the scheme or kind of the structure of the relationships and uh, kind of resonates with the memory function in general. Right? Yeah, of relations. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. of species also, it's like uh, finding, uh, creating a schema and that's kind of a memory aid to yeah. incorporate new information. So there are a lot of predictions behavior and how you cover so I was just I guess it's kind of half comment but I was wondering if you're thinking along these lines or, or see the similarities and 
Yeah, so we're, it's, it's exactly like what the goal of this project was. Um, so the first, like the main problem was, is like how do you control, give everyone the same exposure to some stimulus? So if you had the real social relations, everyone has friends for different amounts of time. So that's a hard one to do. And it, it, you know, it's hard to control, um, balance that across people. So that's like why we did the show to try to, so everyone was least exposed to the same network, even if they're not themselves inserted in the network. Um, and then the idea was, can we basically probe different um, types of memory models and see, does, is the social memory something fundamentally different or does it share these same patterns? And so far, but there's things like recency effects and temp you know, there's lots of things like that which don't make as much sense, especially in this type of show because characters are on all the time and then different things are happening. And, and they're kind of, it's, a lot of it is like confounded. So like trying to dissociate scenes or what the narrative arcs are. It's a character driven drama, so all the narrative arcs revolve around interactions between people. So that might be biasing, at least a rosier picture of how this is going. But in general, how we've been thinking about it is this more contextual way where it's, it's kind of like you have, you, you know, you basically have all the things that, that all the features or things that, that basically bind together when you're encoding. And then when you recall it, it's going to trigger these other types of things. And, and that could be people or it could be groupings or it could be other types of social information. But so far, um, the best thing that's most consistent across all these different analyses is that it's this um, social relational one that seems to come up over and over again. Do you think people have, you have different tendencies to infer these? Uh, yeah, I do. I think there's going to be lots of variation in how this happens. Um, so that some, like just an example, some of the memory types we have, this is this free recall characters, but then he also does queue recall. So which characters come to mind when you think of football or what characters come to mind when you think of like, um, like, I don't know, attractive, or there's different types of trait cues and also um, location cues. And there's also people cues. So who comes to mind when you hear of Tim, you know, and, we, and then th we'll get the order of that. He also has like a free um, recall where he basically, with the microphone, just like um, what Talia used, uh, and this is really similar to Janice Chen's study, he, he basically just recall, like, if you're going to tell a friend about this character, just give a quick narrative summary of them. And so he has that for all the characters. And then he also, like Janice's study, has, uh, can you say a narrative of the entire story? So we have like kind of like really unconstrained like rich data, and then we have like really specific um, ways that we try to probe it in queues to get at that. And he's still kind of working through the details, but yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I have sort of a related question. Is this uh, Carolyn, do you want to start getting set up? Yeah, no, it's a great idea. We haven't been collecting that, although I really want to like get their Netflix like preferences or viewing things like that. Um, in general, sometimes that stuff for good reason is harder to get. Uh, but then I think so. I think it helps with the interpretation. But if people have similar preferences, then we're making an assumption that they should um, kind of be interpreting information or liking the same things at the same points in time. Um, so we don't necessarily need it to be able to make some types of inferences, but it's, we just can't interpret it, I think, without that types of information. But I think, yeah, I think it's a kind of exciting way to go. Um, one of our, like, our random brainstorms when we aren't really doing science, which is most of the time, is like, could you make like a dating app for people who have like um, similar viewing preferences, for example? If that's all you're going to do anyway, like, <laughs> might as well like optimize for that. <laughs> um, do you, like, you want to take five minutes or so? Or? Yeah. All right. Anyway, thanks. Let's, yeah.